Hey everyone, it's Matt. Welcome to session 76 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I'm going to make a few quick announcements here, and then we're going to get you right to this awesome interview that I am really excited to share with you. So, uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, show notes. I reference show notes from time to time, or actually all the time, I suppose, in these interviews. And I'm willing to bet that many of you who are driving around while listening to the podcast may want to go visit the website to get the show notes, but perhaps forget or get distracted or what have you. At least that's been my experience with listening to other podcasts. I sometimes, uh, you know, don't follow up and go look at something that I was interested in. So if that is you, and if you want the show notes to all the episodes delivered right to your email inbox, go to behavioralobservations.com and sign up for the newsletter. So that would be a, a real quick and easy way to make sure you don't miss out on any of the links uh, resources, websites, etc., that we talk about on this podcast. Again, that's behavioralobservations.com, and there's a, uh, I believe it's like a big red button on the right-hand side. Click that, follow the prompts from there, and you'll be good to go. And today's podcast is brought to you by HRIC. Uh, you go to hricolorado.com. Uh, Barb Voss, who's been in the recruiting business for, I don't know, 25 or 30 years, can help you find your dream job. And she can help you with all aspects of your job search. And she can also help companies locate high quality candidates for their positions. So go to hricolorado.com. Com, and we'll hear more about them from uh, a little bit later on. Uh, today's episode is also sponsored by the Act for Behavior Analyst Boot Camp that's coming up in Reno, Nevada. Uh, I believe it's March 3rd through 7th. It'll One of the uh, co-presenters is today's guest, Dr. Evelyn Gould, and it will also be taught by Steve Hayes himself, Mark Dixon, and David Sloan Wilson. It'll be a four-day event, and it will provide 32 hours of continuing ed so uh, lots for everyone. Uh, it's going to be a great event. Uh, the feedback that people uh, provided for the most recent boot camp that was in Baltimore in the fall was just outstanding. So if that's something you're interested in, again, go to today's show notes. Uh, there, All the details are there as well as a uh, coupon code for podcast listeners. So on to today's show. I am going to be chatting with, again, the uh, I, I suppose the aforementioned Dr. Evelyn Gould. We're going to be talking about uh, child and adolescent mental health. Uh, she has a really unique position at McLean Hospital, uh, basically using behavior analysis and ACT to help individuals with mental health challenges. I'm not going to say too much more about it because she does a, a way better job explaining it than I do, but I just thought it was a great Example, it's kind of uh, if you go back to the Steve Hayes episode, he talks a lot about perhaps the a potential future of behavior analysis using you know contextual behavioral science to uh, uh, intervene in areas that uh, you know heretofore we we, we haven't. And she, again, she's got a really unique position at this uh, at this hospital that she'll tell you about. And I just think it's a great story. Um, it's a really fun conversation. Uh, one last thing I'll mention before we get to the uh, conversation is I suppose it's an apology of sorts. Um, I had all of you uh, write in all sorts of great questions. Uh, we just kind of got sidetracked a little bit and had such a fun conversation that I didn't get to them. So I, I uh, genuinely apologize for that. And let's just look at it as an excuse to have Evelyn back on the show, uh, perhaps to do more of a Q&A oriented episode. So um, I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Uh, again, I'm very excited to share it with you. And so without any further delay, uh, let's hear from Dr. Evelyn Gould. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Evelyn Gould, thank you so much for joining me on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, it's a little early for me, but I'm up and ready. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're on the West Coast right now and uh, at, at, at uh, a um, what might be an ungodly time to some. So I appreciate you. Uh, getting up early and, uh, and and joining me today. So we've got uh, a, a lot of fun things to talk about today. Uh, one of the things, I think you came on my radar screen through Jonathan Tarbox. I uh, did a little mm -hmm. email introduction a little while ago and saying, hey, you guys need to get together and talk about ACT and all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, I'm really psyched we made it happen finally. 
Uh, and uh, we, we, of course, can get into that in more detail in a little bit. But first, tell me a little bit more about yourself. How did you get into behavior analysis? How did you discover it? And, you know, kind of what made you think that you want to do it for a career? Um, it's a, that's a very good question. I, you know, like most people, I think, well, that's not true. Not most people. Maybe now, but I did a behavior analysis class in my undergraduate degree that was actually my university, University of Ulster in Ireland. It had a rat lab at the time, and which it no longer has because I've closed that program on that site. But at the time, we had a rat lab, and we were doing this behavior analysis class. Dr. Julian Leslie was there. And I, and I was not interested. <laughs> I was very like, uh, you know, it was very technical. It was EAB strong, and I did not get it. I was doing a you know applied psychology degree, and I mean I thought it was fine, but it just seemed like doing you know I I started well, in school. I was very much about science and mathematics, and then I went you know I had a gap. I was kind of a mature student, so to speak, when I went to university and I decided I was going to do psychology. And so to me, it was like, why am I doing mathematics? It felt like doing mathematics to me. It was so technical and I didn't really get it. I thought it was vaguely interesting. Um, I was kind of on the fence about the whole rat lab thing. So I, so that did not snag me into behavior analysis. But what did was we, as part of my applied degree, we had to do a year uh, placement. So like a practicum kind of year. Uh, because it was applied and I just wanted to go to America so I was just trying to find a placement in America which happened to be a behavior analysis placement and I didn't really care about that I just cared about going to America (laughs) but I ended up I landed in Florida working with Dr. Stokes of Stokes and Bear oh wow I know so crazy and of course I had no clue I didn't know who he was or didn't really care (laughs) I was just like yay Florida America Um, and I got there and I just loved it so much I got to work I basically followed him around um he was you know both he had a learning and behavior clinic in the Shriners Children's Hospital it's a pediatric hospital which probably most people know um and I got to work with him there and then I also got to go to his classes when he was teaching and sit in those classes and follow him around doing research and all kinds of things and consultations it was awesome but the thing that grabbed me the most was the clinic so this clinic was not it was for any any kids any kind of typically developing or otherwise with all kinds of things going on that were referred there through nurses or doctors or people at the hospital um, because they either were concerned about um, maybe there was some learning difficulties there or autism or something like that going on some developmental problems or behavior problems like uh, which could be anything that was interfering with treatment so you know, kids who were refusing medication or were really traumatized by the crazy treatments they had because a lot of the kids had very severe orthopedic issues. Um, so it was all kinds of issues coming through that door. And I just remember watching the team working with those families and thinking like what is this thing this amazing thing that gives hope to all these parents like every family that walked through the door was given hope and like they could be they could be the best version of themselves that they could possibly be and they you know I just was like I want to know what that is (laughs) I want to be part of that I had just not found that it during my psychology degree with other kinds of things going on in psychology it was a lot it was quite pathologizing I felt like the approach and that the other parts of psychology were very much like you know putting the problem in the person and whereas this this team I was just like wow they don't blame the person they don't write people off it doesn't matter what they're struggling with they could they have hope to be better <laughs> to be better versions of whatever it is um they want to be and I just thought that was amazing and I kind of came back to Northern Ireland after that placement and was like everybody everybody you hear this thing I discovered this thing it's called ABA and I just thought like everyone would be so excited about it and they're all like what are you talking about what is we don't care about that <laughs> so I had to work really really hard to find um other people who were working in behavior analysis and I looked out because when I got back, Dennis O'Hora, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's an amazing behavior analyst that works in Ireland, uh, RFT researcher. <clears throat> and he was teaching like a, a what do you call it, a elective, mm-hmm. I guess, as part of my undergraduate degree, uh, advanced behavior analysis. And of course, I chose that. And there was only like four of us in the class. Oh, fun. Um, and he, 
Pete was awesome. He taught, he actually introduced me to RFT in that class. He taught us about RFT, um, specifically how it relates to prejudice and discrimination, because obviously I'm from Northern Ireland, as you can probably tell from my accent. And, you know, I grew up in the troubles there and there's still a lot of problems around sectarianism and uh, discrimination. And he was kind of relating it to that. So I kind of just got the bug. Can, from can you, there. Can you uh, for those who don't know, uh, what, 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 how would you describe what the troubles are? What would be a kind of a Reader's oh, Digest um, version of, of, of Sorry, that? yeah. I'm talking about the conflict um, that went on there for decades and between over um, some part, some people in Northern Ireland uh, who are British who are want who because Northern Ireland is part of the UK, so technically part of the UK. But a lot of people live in there, so they are either strongly attached to being British, um, but then a lot of people there really feel that they're Irish and they want Northern Ireland to be part of the whole the Union of Ireland, like the Ireland. We are all part of the Ireland of Ireland, but actually part of the Ireland as a country. Um, so the conflict is between. The those who wanted to stay part of the UK versus those who felt they were very much Irish and um, resented, like didn't want to be part of the UK, wanted to be have a united Ireland. Um, and that's, a, I guess that's a summary. But what you ended up with was, um, you know, a split between generally Protestant areas uh, or generally po- Protestant populations um, who generally were UK affiliated and then the Catholic pop- Catholic uh the Catholic families um, who are usually very much wanting to be part of the United Ireland and you, we ended up with you know areas of Belfast that were, had, had we had to build huge walls between communities and things because the conflict between them I think that's kind of a good tiny summary yeah that, yeah I just uh, yeah so it's that, that, that's perfect. I just for those who might, I'm 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 uh, I'm half Irish and I grew up in uh, in Massachusetts, so I'm a, I'm a little bit familiar with that. Yeah, it's very sad, and um, you know a lot of discrimination, a huge amount of discrimination. Um, like Protestants versus sides. Catholics, and, yeah, and vice versa, and, whatever. Yeah, so I grew up in that conflict that was still going on when I was a kid. Um, you know, and we have the peace process and all that now, and it's supposedly over. But of course, these communities are still pretty isolated from each other, and there's still a lot of problems. So Dennis, Dennis was it was so fascinating. So Dennis was doing or involved in this RFT research, I guess, looking at symbols, you know, symbolic language, and how that shapes discrimination, or kind of what could we do to kind of undo some of that or change that. It was really interesting. I don't remember the full details because it was a long time ago. It was like 2001, maybe, 2002, maybe around that time. Um, But, of course, he did kind of mention ACT uh, as well, but it was not – he didn't really go into ACT. He just was focused more on the RFT piece. And it wasn't until I went to my master's degree, like I – you know, I had the bug, left Mm -hmm. my undergraduate degree, and there were no – but actually, they just started one a master's in ABA in, in Wales. It was the first one, the first master's program in ABA in the UK. <clears throat> it was in Wales, and I went there, and that's where I kind of got introduced to ACT there as part of my master's program because some researchers there were interested in ACT, um, Stephen Noon, Richard Hastings, and they we did like advanced. I was just so lucky. I feel very, very privileged to have done a degree that this really wonderful ABA master's degree that covered clinical kind of behavior analysis as well as like the usual kind of um, autism type topics. Um, it was much broader. It was more like a clinical, I guess it was more kind of like a clinical applied master's. So we did RFT, we talked about ACT, we talked about naming, um, we read the ACT book, the original ACT textbook as our reading material. You know, I, was, I just feel so lucky and I kind of got the bug from there, I think. That was a very long answer to your question. Uh, yeah, well, that, we like the long answers to the background questions there. I, uh, the, uh, so it's, it's great to get the history. And I think everyone comes into behavior analysis with such a unique story. Uh, mm-hmm. It's fun to get the background details. So. Um, and tell you that I also did the usual like I got a job you know when I came back from Florida I was I'd been waitressing up to that point and you know I did this master's or sorry this 
other class of dentist, but I actually did the whole see a flyer on the wall, like, a, you know, a family looking for somebody to work with their kid. And that was the only job in ABA that and the only kind of work available. And I took that piece of paper and I went and worked with the kid and also was hooked by that too, just the change um, that I saw in that little boy. So I guess that was kind of part of that journey as well, like wanting to stay in it clinically, not just academically being interested, but clinically as well. Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. Do you think the ACT and RFT world is, I guess, proportionally speaking, has better representation in the UK? Uh, in in the behavior analysis programs than than possibly here in the states. And this is probably an impossible question to answer, but I'm just curious. It you've is. got your you got you've had well, you you have a good point perspective in both uh, yeah. uh, community I mean, or camps or whatever. I'm not sure about that. I think I the program that I did certainly has is not typical. I think of most of the programs in America provide to tell because we did have that clinical, that CBA kind of stuff in our program. We also did um, some fluency-based instruction, direct instruction. We did a lot of precision teaching stuff and all kinds of cool things, which I'm not sure is typical, but I don't think that's necessarily typical of all the programs in the UK. Um, I'm not familiar with the curricula with the other programs. I'm actually not even sure how many programs there are. There's not... Not that many still. And certainly, I think the one in Northern Ireland, actually, I don't know, University of Ulster, I would not be surprised if they also covered RFT and uh, ACT because they're because of the teachers there. Um, but I think they're probably mostly autism focused, but I could be wrong about that. So I'm really not sure how to answer that because I'm not, you know, there was only the one program when I did mine and now there's like many more, but it's not as, it's not, ABA is not um, well recognized still in the UK and Ireland. I think ACT, it's weird because I would say ACT is probably much more accepted and RFT and that, that, yeah, they're probably much more accepted than actual AB, traditional ABA. There's still no funding there. It's very difficult for families to still get services. Um, it's a really, I think probably that's true of Europe in general. It's really not as recognized. I mean, I had a friend, a colleague of mine messaging me the other day and she actually trained me. She was my probably my first, well, she wasn't my first supervisor. She was my second supervisor that I had on the job. She's an amazing clinician, really, you know, experienced. And she was asking me whether she, really, whether she should re- renew her certification, her BCBA, because she was just kind of like, no one really cares about that here still. Nobody cares, and I've got to get all these CEUs. And I'm actually thinking of leaving the leaving the field, leaving the field, and going into trauma work because no one cares about what I'm doing. It was very sad to me that still. Now it's still like that, but she's feeling like the certification she has is meaningless. Um, oh, no. You know, I, I, I talked her into keeping it. <laughs> I was like, well, take your, why you. don't you take your BCBA into your trauma work? Take it with you, you know. And um, 
take your skills. You're going to take all your learning history with you, so why not take that certification with you? So she is, I think she's going to keep keep it. But yeah, it's a different, it's a totally different world from the states where pretty much everybody knows what ABA is, or at least has heard of it and understands. Um, Do you, um, you know, I know, like, you know, the explosion of applied behavior analysis here in the states. I think many would agree would be tied to the funding that came along with insurance mm-hmm. mandates and things along those lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you, do you, are you aware of any efforts uh, that are similar in uh, the UK, uh-huh. Ireland, Europe or whatever that, that uh, is there advocacy afoot that would uh, you know, that that's kind of paving the way for that. And then, you know, what we would like to see is the you know coverage of these types of services for kids with, autism or whatever, you know, kind of uh, unique behavioral or learning challenges? I mean, uh, I'm, I would want to bring out, I mean, obviously I'm not living there right now. I'm living in the States. I'm a little bit removed from it, but I know that for sure the behavior analysts there are trying, trying to fight, fight this. And parents, for sure. I mean, the only reason that I got that job and I got trained was because parents in Northern Ireland had raised money um, as a charity, had put together this charity and raised money to pay for two people to come to, to I think one, one was American, one was Welsh, but they came over to Northern Ireland, paid for them to come and train local people, one of whom was me, one of whom was me, um, to start this, start providing ABA services. And, you know, the parents kind of made that happen. And I think it's still that way. I think it's the parents and the behavior analysts are trying, but the problem is the NHS, you know, we have the NHS there, the National Health Service, so it's a little different. And um, we have the education service and I think neither at least when I was there, neither wants to pay because it's so expensive. So, you know, we have the health service saying it's an education problem. So it's not our problem. Education has to pay for it. And then education saying it's not, it's a, it's a medical problem and no one wants to pay for it. I mean, when I left, they were doing a bit better. Some of the schools, the special needs schools, like I was actually working and consulting in one of the really wonderful special needs schools there. Um, they were open to us. But again, the, basically my salary is being paid for by this charity <laughs> and these parents who'd raised money. Um, so I don't think it's much better, I, but I really can't speak to what exactly is happening right now because I'm not living there. Um, I'm living in the States at the minute. All right. So let's, let's, uh, let's talk about that. So wh- what, is it, uh, what is it that you do for a living right now? So right now I work uh, in at McLean Hospital, which is the psychiatric teaching hospital for Harvard Medical School, and I work in a residential and partial hospitalization program there that treats children and adolescents with very, very severe OCD um, and anxiety. Now that they have to have that diagnosis to come into our program, but obviously often they have a lot of other things going on because they are the kids basically that have failed, failed um, out of other kinds of treatments, other kinds of programs, lower levels of care. So they've, they've not responded to the typical protocols um, or the general treatment that's available. Um, and they, they end up kind of with us um, uh, really, really struggling. So they're very, very, very impaired, as you can imagine, to be in residential. And I'd say about half of the kids, it seems like about half of our kids are also on the spectrum, um, which kind of makes sense to me because that's why they're not responding to the average kind of treatment protocol that's designed for a typically developing person and oft- or even adult. Does that make sense? So to me, like those kids end up with us because the, because the the general kind of outpatient psychologists that are working with them don't know how to address the barriers that come along with being on the spectrum. Um, But then other kids that come to us that are not on the spectrum, they also have like, you know, a plethora of deficits as well. Like other, some of them have, you know, Tourette's as well or uh, trichotillomania. And um, maybe they, I've noticed that a lot of our kids have like a lot of social deficits and executive functioning deficits and, um, but they're awesome. I love it so much. (laughs) Do you work with kids with eating disorders? 
Uh, you know, we do. Actually, I have a kid right now that has that has a eating disorder, but we actually refer if that's the primary and they're they're not in the in the position to be able to kind of work on that. Um, we tend to refer out, so we can't because we're not specialised uh, in that in even dealing with eating disorders in our unit and we can't so we can work with it but if you're needing like a very high level of care like a one-to-one which this kid needs kind of one-to-one um and isn't really willing uh we aren't equipped medically we're not like a medical facility either so we're not equipped medically we don't really we can do one-to-one kind of support for brief periods of time but we don't have enough staff to kind of give very intensive one-to-one kind of treatment so Kind of yes, but no. <laughs> it's not. It's not like if that's the primary, then we would refer out. So okay. if the primary problem isn't OCD and anxiety, um, then we tend to like refer to where somewhere where that can be, whatever that primary problem is, can be dealt with. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, do you? Uh, so they. Uh, how long have you been at McLean? I have been there for just over a year now. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I mean, I love it. It's so, it's so good. I am the first behavior analyst that they've hired there. That's where I was going with this. Yeah, talk, so, talk about that because I think that's, I think that's a really <laughs> cool thing about your position, or at least from what little I know about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, usually you would think, okay, if a, a, you know a, a setting with you know that that treats individuals with these types of mental health and psychiatric challenges that that would be the province of the the licensed clinical psychologist realm right um mm-hmm. but but they went and got themselves a bcba so uh yes. talk, talk to me a little bit about that what were they uh what what, what was the um i guess the the ra- yeah what, what were they not, yeah. what were they thinking of course so, it makes sense to us <laughs> as behavior analysts but it's a it's a yeah. i would have to imagine it's a very unusual decision uh, for those who aren't familiar with what we do and things like that. So I'd, lo- I'd love to hear the, the kind of backstory about how they realized they needed, you know, someone with your skill set and so forth. Yeah, and I would say this is a tip for the newly minted people or people who want to do other stuff. So hi, this is how I did this. I made friends with people <laughs> outside <laughs> of my field. I really did. And that's kind of in my act journey, you know, I stalked Lisa Coyne, basically, like followed her to conferences and basically made her help me um, with this, this. So getting a bit into the act thing, but like I really wanted to help to help these parents that I was working with that were struggling so much. And, know, and I wanted to know what to do with these really high-functioning kids as well and staff who were really struggling. So I basically stopped Lisa Coyne, who is a clinical psychologist and very well-known in the ACT world. She's an expert in ACT with kids and families. And she worked, She was working at, she's working at McLean. She started that program. And I, through that networking, you know, I kept connecting with her. She got to know me. And I'd be, she was kind of a mentor to me. So I'd be talking to her about my work. She trained, did training with me. So she really liked, I guess she just really got jazzed by what I was doing. And she's pretty, she's a behaviorist at heart. Like she has good training. Um, she's very pro behavior analysis anyway. But when she started this program, she started kind of being like, well, would you come and work for me? Would you come and work with me? Uh, we need you. We need you. And of course me, I'm, I have terrible imposter syndrome uh, always. And so oh. I'm just like, I don't know how to do Join that. the club. Join the Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I totally get that. <laughs> and, like, no, she, and I kept thinking like, she has no idea what I do. She has no idea what I do. She doesn't know what she's asking for, which is not true. She really did. <laughs> Um, and she knew that this skill set that I had would be really beneficial to the kids there. And because the kids there, well, one, they're kids and they're living there and the staff need to know how to kind of parent, parent them. Um, we have the skill. So we have that kind of skill of parent, knowing how to kind of parent kids, I guess. Uh, we also understand development, which is super important when you're working with kids and adolescents, like understanding kind of. Uh, what typical development should look like. Um, we understand skill deficits, so I can walk, I can meet these kids and not just think about symptom reduction. Um, I can meet them and be like, "Wow, they're really struggling with like you know X, Y, and Z as well. We got to work on that. Um, how do we how do we do that?" I'm about like increasing those socially significant behaviors as well as decreasing the problem. 
and a lot of them have very severe behavior challenges. Um, and of course, taking a functional approach, of course, is really, really important. Um, so she really did know what she was asking for. And she just kind of bugged me. She just kept prodding at me being like, when are you coming? When are you coming? When are you coming? Um, and eventually, I kind of just decided to jump in the deep end with that imposter syndrome. I took it with me and kind of got there and was like, oh, this is just, yeah, I see how this works. <laughs> and I felt very, weirdly felt very comfortable for me. I did not expect that at all, but it really did feel comfortable. I mean, obviously there was a learning curve. I had to learn a lot and I'm still learning, but it it weirdly felt comfortable and but also it was welcoming so I wasn't in, I wasn't like Matt I really liked your uh, talk the other day on school consultation it, and I've done a lot of school consultation with LAUSD actually and it's not like where you're inserted into the classroom you know by either the parent or by the district or whoever is just like inserting you into the mm-hmm. into dealing with this problem um, I wasn't just insert forced in there I was asked to come so it was a really nice experience of feeling welcomed and people being being very curious about like who are you and what do you do and oh what is oh what are you doing there that's cool <laughs> you know it was a it was like a different experience for me that doesn't happen a lot as a behavior analyst I think most of the time I feel like behavior analyst experience is like people being really suspicious and like you're kind of enforced upon them um like even parents you know I think a lot about how parents are kind of like un, unwilling patients kind of like they they bring their child to you and then next thing they know you're saying to them hey you need you need help <laughs> you need to change your behavior and and they didn't come there for that they just kind of came does that make sense they just kind of came for their child yeah so have a weird kind of job it's not like the regular psychologist where people kind of come to them and say help me <laughs> Um, we, we often are working with very unwilling kind of clients, so to speak. So let's talk about the, I, I want to talk about your par- your uh, work with parents with uh, Jonathan Tarbox uh, in a bit, but um, I want to stay with the hospital setting here for, for a little bit. What is, what is your like kind of day to day like, you know? Um, so, you know, you mentioned a, a, a variety of things that, that you um, address, but you know, what, what is, I, there's probably no such thing as a typical day I would imagine, but you know, you know, how, how, how do you interact with the, are, are you seeing kids individually or, you know, are you doing uh, groups? Um, you know, just kind of, if you can give us a flavor of what this might look like, cause most of us probably can't relate to that. Um, yeah. most of us are either working in schools or in ABA clinics or doing home, uh, home-based, uh, uh, therapy with, with kids on the spectrum. So enlighten us. Well, it's kind of interesting because the model they have there is actually quite similar to our typical model where you have me or the clinician, the behavior therapist or whatever you want to call it, call us. Um, we design the treatment plans or the treatment programs for the kids and then to be implemented by the floor staff. So in, in the hospital, we call them community residence counselors, but we would call ours RBTs, mm-hmm. but there's similar level. Um, in terms of like education and kind of like clinical level. So the art, these uh, floor staff implement our treatment plans and we supervise them doing so. So that model is quite familiar to me. <laughs> and then I'm the one then working with the parents and the kids. I do work with the kids as well, but primarily the, the bulk of the treatment is really done by the floor staff or the RBT type uh, staff. Um, so so basically, it's very behavioral. So our focus, um, our treatment is focused in exposure uh, treatment, so exposure and response prevention, and then ACT. So we infuse those two. And then often I'm also, you know, using other more traditional ABA strategies to help my kids. So, you know, incentive plans and um, other kinds of planned ignoring or whatever is I'm doing. So the kind of calm, that's the kind of combo. So the traditional kind of ABA stuff, ACT, and then the exposure and response prevention. So what a typical day looks like is I might run, I do run a group. I run an ACT group. So all the kids are in that group and we, it's more like just a skills training group. So that's an opportunity for me to introduce some um, ACT skills. And then 
usually the kids have uh, a variety of them treatment blocks where the RBT type people are working with them. So they have like an exposure block. So they do one-to-one coached exposure uh, per my plan, whatever I've decided that the kid, what they're working on. They have self-directed exposure. So there's a group of kids in a room with a counselor, but they're trying to get them to self-direct their treatment. Um, then they have education because they're kids. They have to do some schooling. So there'll be an education. So I, so for, and then they have kind of groups and other things going on. For me, I'm kind of floating around. So I will do the group and I lead the group. Then I might go and overlap with the staff member doing the exposure. I like to do that a lot because I'm a very like in the trenches person. <laughs> um, I don't like to be the kind of supervisor that just kind of stands back and doesn't get involved. Um, I, I like to be in the trenches with my staff and help them. So often I'll go to an exposure and either they'll be watching me, I'll be modeling, or I'm kind of watching them and observing how the kid's doing with the treatment. Um, I then usually have one or two individual meetings with the kids. So the kid, the kid and I will meet together, just the two of us. We will go over their treatment plan, discuss how it's going, um, see if we need to make tweaks. I'll like address issues, any issues that have been coming up. Uh, I will address address directly with them if there's like social conflicts or just um, they're struggling with you know getting out of bed in the morning or whatever the difficulties have been. <laughs> I will kind of address that with the kid. And of course, I'm also using ACT with them. So I'm trying to get some flexibility if I'm noticing uh, some rigidity that's getting in their way or some problematic behaviors in when they're meeting with me. I'm like actually trying to address that as it's coming up. And then, of course, there's family stuff. So I sometimes I'm meeting with the kid and their family or I'm just meeting with the parents. Um, sometimes I'm just meeting with a kid to kind of figure out how we're going to navigate problems with the family. It's kind of all, every, all and everything. <laughs> um, and then I have meetings with the other staff, you know, I have meetings with staff too, where I'm trying to help the staff throughout the day. It could be like a 10 minute conversation in the office, like, oh, this, I'm having this problem with your kid. What should I do? Um, or I don't really understand this part of the treatment plan, or can you show me whatever it is? Like I'm, I kind of meet with them throughout the day, but I also sometimes have formal meetings if they need to address something um, more formally. And I meet with my colleagues as well. We have we kind of do group supervision. So the clinicians will meet to be like, oh, I don't know what to do with this kid, help, <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, or sometimes we'll do skills training with each other or share because I work with this multidisciplinary kind of team and, it, and I want to learn everything I can. And I have, you know, I have one colleague who's like an expert in dialectical behavior therapy, DBT. So mm-hmm. I'm always curious about that because I don't really know, know much about that. Um, and I, then my other colleague is more like tr- the clinical psychologist, traditional act um, stuff, but she knows stuff that I don't know as well. So we kind of put our heads together and then I'm like, I have all that behavioral, behavior analysis stuff that they want. So it's kind of cool. That's, I guess that's kind of basically what my day looks like. Sometimes I'm also on the phone, you know, doing calls to coordinate with the child's teachers or um, therapists and all that. So usual stuff that we have to do and less administrative stuff, which is nice Um, because it's a hospital. I don't, you know, it's a hospital setting, so I'm not having to do the God awful reports (laughs) that I was having to do as a BCBA and outpatient setting. Um, That's nice. I don't spend a lot of time doing that kind of stuff anymore. I see. What, uh, so um, can you talk about, you mentioned exposure and response prevention, and I know those are kind of traditional, I guess, uh, tools or techniques or what have you. Can you can you define those um, for those who are not familiar with it? Yeah, it's basically just involved. Basically, just involves you or the kid exposing, being willing to expose themselves to feared stimuli. So stimuli that evoke um, that avoidant response or that fear response. Um, and then the response prevention is just inhibiting the usual avoidance response that you have in the presence of that stimulus. So for example, if you're scared of spiders, it would involve you exposing yourself to spiders, like allowing the spider to be there and not running away, like just sitting. (laughs) 
and inhibiting whatever the response is. So with OCD, it involves um, exposing yourself to whatever the feared stimulus is that the stimulus that like brings up those obsessive thoughts. So um, I think of one of I can think of one of my kids right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of my kids has very interesting obsessions around politics actually I'm noticing that's like more common wow. um, yeah he's very so he gets very very anxious about what's happening in the world and Trump and um, are we going to end up in some kind of apocalyptic handmaid's tale kind of situation like this is kind of where his mind goes so for him right now, he's actually worked, he's done really well. He's worked up to, he was not able to be around electronics, essentially. Like he just could not be near a computer or a phone and not, he calls it rabbit holing, but not start clicking and clicking and clicking, going down this tunnel of researching, 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 researching. I need to know, I need to know, I need to know what's happening. I need to know what's happening. Kind of, of finding everything he could out about a certain political issue. So now he is able to be on electronics. So the exposure involved him being on a computer and not and resisting clicking and going down the rabbit hole. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So we worked up to, for example, he, you know, the 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 RBT type person would put in a search on the computer, like Mueller investigation, uh, would type that into the search and press search, and he would have to sit and kind of see the results. And just kind of sit there and not and inhibit that urge to start like clicking on stuff um, um, in this ritualistic way. So I hope that kind of gives you an example. Yeah, of yeah. No, that's yeah. that's that's yeah. that is a very yeah, that's a that's a really neat example because I was I was thinking like you know you'd use an example of like hand washing or leaving the stove on or something like that. And I'm sure you probably deal with plenty of that stuff too. But we do, we do. Yeah. That, that's a pretty that's a pretty unique uh, unique example. So. Uh, so I would speculate and please tell me if I'm wrong. So the act stuff would come in perhaps where, you know, you teach him some skills to kind of diffuse, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, those urges, uh, to, uh, or ex- accept the discomfort of wanting to click and, uh, knowing that, uh, doing so that takes him away from things he cares about, et cetera. Is, is that how you would, uh, infuse some of those act skills? So, yeah, so I, I think of ACT as basically ER exposure, mm-hmm. <laughs> exposure response prevention. But what we're talking about is exposure to private events, right? Exposure to a versus private events. So essentially, you know, teaching the kids, yes, there's the values piece is very, very important. So the kids can, I mean, so the kids can kind of connect to why they're doing these really, really hard things. Um, and, and often, like, we're shaping, right? So we're starting, like, with a very small approximation towards what we're trying to get them to be able to do in life. So for this kid on the computer, uh, he the goal is for him to be able to use electronics in a healthy way and to be able to do schoolwork and to be able to play games on there if he wants to, be able to email and, like, interact with his peers, to be able to have a job, to be able to do these bigger life things. But we started off, like not even touching the computer. It was just being around the computer, like not even going near there. So connecting him with that, those values of like, I want to be able to, you know, if I get married and have to go around to my wife's family's home, I don't want to have to sit upstairs in the bedroom while they watch TV because I can't be near the TV in case I see something that's triggering. You know, connecting him with these life kind of things and who he wants to be as a person helps helps bring meaning to this really scary thing of just sitting around a computer. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so the values piece for sure helps with the willingness to do the really hard stuff um, in the service of things that matter to you. It adds some of that appetitive, uh, the appetitives to that aversive situation or reinforcement access. You can access reinforcement even while you're um, experiencing all this aversive stuff. So that's really important. And then just teaching the kids to um, notice like what's controlling their behavior, I guess. So noticing when they're, their behavior, they're not being, they're under verbal control essentially. And they're not sensitive to kind of what's going on, what the world's telling them. And they're just like in their heads um, following rules or whatever's happening. It helps them kind of sensitize to like their experience. And that's like the present moment kind of stuff. Discriminating. We just talk about like, are you in your head or are you in the world? Um, 
I think the kids really get that, especially the you know they're like this kid who's I'm talking about with the politics. He has a lot of like mental rituals that he's doing. You know, he's obsessing and thinking like and trying to reassure himself and doing all of this stuff to try and feel okay. So we want him, we want him to be able to notice that. We want him to be able to notice like when he's all in his head and not like in his experience. Um, and being able to choose kind of then what direction to move in instead of just responding to like what he's feeling and what he's thinking. Um, the ACT piece really helps with that. It helps with this being able to open up to the experience, I guess. The acceptance piece is really, really helpful. And like you said, Matt, the diffusion piece, so teaching the kids to be able to get some distance between their thoughts and their emotions, be able to like not be pushed around by them, not be controlled by their verbal stuff. Um, it's a very, very helpful. Like I think primarily for me, adding ACT it's just like a human thing I think like just to when you see these kids doing these really 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 hard things um, like giving them the ACT skills just helps bring some humanity to it like just some I don't know if I'm explaining that well but it's like you you see the difference in them instead of like kind of gritting their teeth and kind of being like, oh, I'm just doing this really hard thing. You can see them kind of being like, okay, I'm doing this hard thing because it's moving me in this direction. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to experience this hard thing. Um, that makes all the yeah. sense in the world to me. Yeah. Do, do you use a specific curriculum when you're doing the instructional piece to, to act? Um. For the groups, for the groups, I use the DNAV model. I love that. I love it so much. It's Louise Hayes' work and jo Joseph Karachi. I don't know if I pronounced his name right, um, but it's the thriving adolescent stuff. So she uses this beautiful, simple. Uh, part of the reason why I really like it is it's a learning model. So I have an issue with people taking act like it's a protocol and just like applying it to like doing it to kids you really especially or anybody really adults too but with kids you really need to be thinking about learning and you know the kids I work with or all kids don't know for example they don't know how to value like they don't have that skill set yet um, so you have to teach them you can't just sit down and be like what are your values um, right. what do you care about the kids don't know that they don't have life experience um, they need to learn how to identify what they care about and they also are very much operating on that immediate reinforcement contingencies right they don't know how to so they're so, and if you're under if you're really oriented to the immediate consequences immediate consequences you're going to be primarily avoidant right you're only going to be that's going to be like what's dominating your behavior that avoidant repertoire um so we have to teach the kids how to operate with respect to these longer, later reinforcers. Like that is a huge part of our program um, and them figuring out what they care about because they also often come in. And if you ask them, like, what do you care about? You get a bunch of clients, right? So you get a bunch of like responses that have been that they think they're supposed to say. So, you know, oh, I care about education. Guess where they got that from? Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a rule that's been taught to them. Um, it's not actually what they really, really care about. So you have to do a lot of, I do a lot of exploring um, with them and also teaching them to track is another skill that they don't know how to do. So they often don't, um, they're just either, so what I mean by that is they're not noticing the, the outcomes of their behavior. You know, they are, again, operating with that with respect to those immediate consequences and not noticing, like, how these behaviors that they're engaging in maybe are not helping them in the long run. Or they're not taking feedback from the world either. So, you know, they're just responding to whatever's going on in their heads, those, that rule-governed kind of stuff. And they're not noticing that what their we call you know what their OCD or what their advisor is telling them is actually not lining up with what the world is telling them. Like so, I'm trying to help them notice. 
uh, what is what the world is actually telling them about their behavior and getting out of their heads. Does that make sense? So yeah. and sensitizing them to those direct contingencies, is, I guess, is a way to describe it. Um, and the DNA V model does a really nice job of that because Louise Hayes uh, is very uh, much about thinking about development and thinking about learning and teaching kids how to language about the world. Um, uh, does that make sense? Yes. So and you said it's, it's the DNAV similar. model? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I will run that down and have a link to that in the show notes because I know I'm going to get emails from folks saying, what is that? I want to learn more. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, it's awesome. So I use that in my groups um, and it's very, the language in it is kid oriented. So we don't talk about the hexaflex ever. We, we don't talk about, um, sometimes with some of the kids, I'll use some of the act terms depending on the kid and what's functional and useful. Um, but often I don't use those words with them. I, but, I, but the DNAV, I would use a kind of this idea if you have your advisor, which is the part of you that talks to you, the you know, the thoughts um, in your head, and then you have your values, we use that term, and then you have your noticer, which is like your five senses, like noticing with your five senses the part that takes this is like my political kid is like, it's your data taker. And I was like, okay, yeah. So you collect all this data and then you have this advisor that interprets the data. That was the way he describes it. He's geeky. <laughs> Um, and then we have a discoverer, which is your trial and error learner. So the part of you that does stuff, you know, and you've got to have all of these parts working together. So the kids love it. The kids really get it. Uh, even the kids on the spectrum get it because it's very simple. Um, we have a lot of fun with it. And I, yeah, I highly recommend that model. So I use that in the groups a lot. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the age ranges of the children that you work with? Uh, they are 10 to 19, I think, is the oldest. But 10 would be about the youngest. I see. Mm -hmm. I see. So it's like fourth, fifth grade. Um, <clears throat> I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. I'm still struggling with the, with the American grade system, even though I worked in school for a very long time. <sighs> I would just be curious to see how the instruction might differ as you go younger, um, you know, and I'm maybe more direct contingency related types of interventions would be appropriate. And, um, but I'm just curious how to, you know, if you had any experience or if you know of anything with, uh, with younger children in terms of, um, uh, doing some of this work, but I, I, I like the idea of, of, you know, obviously avoiding some of the jargon and things like that. And I, I definitely want to look, look up that DNAV model. Um, some of the curricula we've talked about here on the podcast before has been mainly stuff that's been put out by uh, Mark Dixon and his mm -hmm. colleagues, mm -hmm. the, uh, the mm -hmm. um, AIM. The AIM, is, mm -hmm. yeah, AIM mm -hmm. and then the one he had before that, the uh, Act for Children with Autism yes, and yes, uh, Emotional yes. Challenges. So, um, I guess um, the younger kids, you know, I still use the DNAV with them. The examples and things. So something that I think, a few things that I think are important when you're working with kids, you have to think, you have to meet the kids where they're at. So the first thing I do is being a behavior analyst, I'm going to assess what their skill level is and what are their deficits. Sometimes I have to, especially the kids on the spectrum, they don't even know how to label their emotions. Like they don't know how to tap emotions. And, how, you know, there's no point in me like jumping in with this higher level act stuff if they can't even do that. So we might start there or, you know, whatever the skill deficits are, I have to address those and kind of scaffold up to some of these um, act concepts. Um, I forgot where my train of thought was. That was not where I was going on this question. That's um, okay. We were talking about using these uh, interventions with younger children. Uh, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes you don't need to use act. Like sometimes, you, I mean, I think it's very helpful to consider how the private events are involved in the kid's behavior or like what's going on, but that doesn't mean that I need to use ACT all the time. Sometimes I can absolutely use direct contingency stuff. Um, my usual ABA strategies are enough. I don't need to use the ACT stuff. Usually with the kids I work with, though, I have to because they are there because <laughs> they are having extreme difficulties with aversive private events. Um, 
on the, the, the OCD side of things. But I mean, again, still, I've definitely had kids where I've pri- we've primarily just, you know, especially kids who, I had a kid who was very unwilling, did not want to work with the OCD, but was severely, severely impaired. Like she came to us and was, um, not even, she didn't even have bed clo- clothing, bed clothes in her bedroom. Uh, her bedroom was completely void of uh, any items. It was just a bare room. It was like a cell. It was awful. Uh, she couldn't she couldn't go off the unit. She couldn't do anything. She was very, very impaired, and she was not willing to work on the OCD. So we had to take charge of that. We had to fight it for her, and that, it really did involve a huge amount of just planned ignoring and understanding the function of, like, what she was doing, um, prompting and just uh, extinction, even, like, procedures, you know. So sometimes that is the approach, the primary approach. We don't always... We don't always have to use ACT. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work you've done uh, with parents. Uh, and and mm-hmm. as I mentioned earlier, I, um, Jonathan Tarbox is the person who kind of connected us. And I know you guys have done some work uh, in using ACT with parents. Um, and, and in particular, uh, you guys published a paper uh, Gould, Tarbox, and Coin. Uh, was it 2017? Uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah. So. It came out online, I think, in 2017. Um, and I, I have yeah. I have the reference, and I'll I'll put that in the notes for today's episode too. But uh, um, so, if you could kind of tell us a little bit about that study, uh, you know, kind of what you did, what you learned from it, and things like that, that would be great. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Well, where do I start? Well, <laughs> I, I guess I, I, I came believe... to the study. Go, go ahead, sir. Well, I, if uh, memory serves, it was uh, using ACT to uh, work yes. with with parents of kids uh, with autism mm-hmm. to, uh, mm-hmm. I, 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 um, I think it was I guess... uh, to increase their, you know, their, their observable, uh, uh, yes. measurable behavior, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, on mm-hmm. is it related to their the implementation of some sort of behavioral protocol and I might be totally messing this up so I'll I'll mm-hmm. shut up and let <laughs> let you the author tell, no, tell the audience about it. No, that was the gist of it. I was just I guess I was just thinking like where do I even start in terms of the history behind that study because I didn't just make, come up with that study out of the blue, you know, because uh, I had a dissertation to do. That this is like a ba- the baby of years and years and years of trying to figure out how to help parents better. So that was the problem um, you were trying to solve. Yeah. So, I mean, that's how I came to ACT and was excited about ACT all those years ago because I would be, you know, I was working in homes with families and seeing that just my regular toolbox was not cutting it in terms of getting these parents to actually do what I needed them to do. And they were telling me, like they were telling me with their words saying, I am really, really anxious. I just, I can't, it's so difficult for me. I just can't do this. It's too painful kind of thing that they're telling me. And I just didn't know what to do. And I was really frustrated because I really truly believed in behavior analysis. I was a radical behaviorist and I was kind of like, I, my science should know what to do here. I shouldn't be feeling like I am either using common sense uh, or to try and like, you know, give them advice about, oh, you know, don't feel that way or it's okay, you can do it, like whatever I was trying to do to get them to do what I wanted them to do or shoving research in their face or whatever. I I was like, I shouldn't be just using common sense or just trying to do this. There should be, and I shouldn't also be just referring them down the road to somebody who's you know, approach I don't agree with mentalistic kind of stuff down the road, psychology or whatever, like that doesn't feel right to me. Um, so, but I couldn't find, I couldn't, I, there was nothing kind of to tell me what to do. And then I discovered ACT and was like, aha, <laughs> this is it. This could be, is this the thing? Maybe this is the thing. Uh, maybe this is the piece that's missing. And it, I then went on this really long journey to try and figure out like how to do ACT in this context, because of course, ACT came out of the psychotherapy uh, adult kind of realm, um, not out of ABA uh, or out of our, you know, all the books were oriented towards, and they still primarily are oriented towards people who are doing psychotherapy with people with a variety of clinical diagnoses. Um, so I had to 
it took me a really long time to figure out like how to translate that into the work that I was doing with these families with autism or kids with autism. Um, and that this project or this <laughs> this uh, study kind of was the baby of that. Like eventually. Um, figuring out like how do I how do I do this and then I want to know is it going to work like is this actually going to result in overt behavior change because of course the the other thing about the act literature was that no one was really measuring overt behavior it was all um, self-report pre-post kind of stuff and I would be reading these studies and thinking okay they said they felt better but right. were they better I don't know like I was very skeptical about that because you know we've all been around people who say like oh yeah I feel great and you're like but you're still doing the thing you're still uh, <laughs> you're still you know you're saying you, you think things are better but I don't I don't really see that um, so I was a little skeptical, um, but, you know, obviously as I delved into the act and I was like peeling off the layers, the mid-level term kind of stuff and getting below the hood into the real principles-based kind of behavior analysis stuff, I, I, I read that and I was like, yeah, this should work because from, an, from a behavior analysis perspective, this, this should work. Um, it's, it's just like, this is, it's just ABA, <laughs> it's right. ABA. Um, but you're dealing with private events and verbal behavior. Um, so I, I believe that it should work, but I hadn't, I wanted to see if it did work. And that's why I ended up doing that for my dissertation. It's funny because I had Jonathan Tarbox as my advisor and even he, and he's like so proact, you know, obviously he's very proact and really into RFT, but even he tried to talk me out of it. <laughs> Because he was like, Evelyn, you have to, you just need to get dumb. Like, you uh, need to get your vision dumb. Don't do this. It's going to be really hard. Um, and it, yeah, he, even he was kind of like, I don't think you should do this. Um, but now, of course, here, we, we produced this great study. I'm so proud. Um, and it did get done. So that's where we ended, <laughs> ended up. Uh huh. Um, and part of that process was getting Lisa Coyne to, uh, as I said, I kind of stalked her and was like, please help me. Because Jonathan, you know, he was really enthusiastic about the app stuff and wanted me to, you know, was involved in it. But he couldn't give me, I didn't have anyone around me that could help me clinically, like know what should this look like or what might the protocol be? Like, what do I need to put in there? Um, what do I need to do as an intervention? And so Lisa Coyne came on board and helped me with that piece. So mm-hmm. let's get into that a little bit. Uh, what what yeah. um, what were the target behaviors you were trying to improve, and, and what was what was the intervention that you used to uh, do that? So what I was looking to increase was values directed behavior, or like you know socially significant behavior, if you will. And so for the parents, we chose kind of broad response classes. So essentially, like. I would I I did kind of an interview with the parents where I tried to figure out like what those might be. So for some parents it might have been this broad class of self-care, right? The value was self-care. And when we kind of pulled that apart, we might have behavior examples of like uh going to yoga twice a week or um like one parent was like taking a bath by myself. <laughs> I haven't taken a bath by myself in like ten years or whatever it was. Um uh, reading a book, you know, or going for a walk with like, my kids or just those kind of things kind of came up, uh, getting my nails done, whatever it was for that parent, self-care. So all of those behaviors would come under the value of self-care. That would be values directed. Um, another common one for parents, actually, and one of the parents in the study was independence. So they identified child independence as something they were really struggling with. So they had a 12-year-old, I believe he was 12 at the time, and she just had never, ever been apart from him, ever. Like she, did, she just went everywhere with him. He wasn't even allowed to go to another aisle in the in Target or something. He wasn't allowed to go look at something by himself. Or, and he was in a general ed kind of situation. The like, uh, kid had done very well in intervention. So he really did need to start getting some independence from her. So she chose that as being a value that she was not following. <laughs> Um, so we chose like things like go to allow your kid to go to the video games aisle um, while you're looking at something else. And this is a 12 year old. So that's totally appropriate. 
for allowing the kid to wait in the car while she went to post a letter or something like that, allowing the kid to go get a meal and come back in, allowing the kid to walk the dog around the block. Um, so any kind of any instance, I think we defined it as like any instance of the parent being not in the presence of the child for at least a, I think we had a time definition maybe in there or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I was looking for was like any behavior that was in line with this value that the parent identified and the parent chose the behaviors. So the parent, <clears throat> I didn't impose that on them. I allowed them to decide what was values directed and what was not. Um, and obviously doing those behaviors, the function is, is kind of this intrinsic kind of reinforcement. Like I'm following the value and it's like a petitive kind of control there, like approach behaviors. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so that, that's what I was looking to increase. And so what was the, uh, what was the intervention package, if you will? Um, how, how did you, uh, that was, so, yeah. yeah. So the intervention was an act protocol. Uh, it was six sessions. It's so weird. It wasn't that long ago. And now I feel like it was like forever ago. And I'm like, oh, I have to remember this right. I believe it was six sessions. Um, but really, One of them was like a pre-interview, I believe, if I remember rightly, like a pre kind of interview. And then there was the skill building was like the five sessions after that, I think. And so we we targeted, we did actually, the protocol was designed around the hexaplex. So for those of you who don't know, the hexaplex is kind of like an act clinical tool, uh, which involves six I guess six uh, repertoires or six processes, whatever you want to call them. That's a little issue for me. (laughs) Are they processes? Are they repertoires? Um, What are they? So these six uh, pieces of psychological flexibility. So we have acceptance, diffusion, self as context, uh, mindfulness, values, and now I'm blanking on the other one. Did I say six or did I say five? You said so six, so wait, we got, uh, hold on, I got to use my fingers here. Diffusion, <laughs> acceptance, present moment awareness, committed action, values, and selfless yeah, content. Committed action, there you go, that was the one I left off. Yeah, so we did design. I, to me, it's really just a clinical tool to help organize the organize the clinician's behavior, right? Oh, that makes um, sense. Yeah, Um so we we had all of those processes involved in this protocol, so all of the act pieces, and we kind of had sessions like the five sessions sort of had a more of an emphasis in skill building. Like the, one of them was more emphasizing mindfulness, so skill building around mindfulness. One of them was more of an emphasis on values and acceptance. Um, one of them was more about like weathering your thoughts, diffusion. But within each of the sessions, you were really targeting all of them as needed. Um, so there's like a lot of flexibility built into the protocol. Like you could, you know, sort of like, here's the general skill that we're trying to shape here. But as things come up, you should be flexing <laughs> with the parent, um, tracking what's happening and, um, you know, using your skills functionally. You may have um, mentioned this earlier, uh, I, I, but yeah. uh, I, I, did you, um, did you meet with the parents individually to administer this? Yes, that's a good point. So I did do individual parent training with them. It was not group. I so I know, I know some other people have been doing group stuff. So I met with a parent one-to-one for about, it was usually between 60 minutes to 90 minutes, um, depending on what was going on in the session. Um, I met with them at their home, like I drove out to their home. It wasn't in the clinic. I... I felt it was important for generalization to do it in the home, um, personally. I was thinking, like, if I want them using these skills, like, outside of when I'm there, it made sense to me for them to be practicing these skills in the context where I need them to use them. So that's why I chose to go to their home. But you could easily do it in the clinic, too. Um, I also chose the one-to-one because I wanted to be able to individualize what I was doing with the parent. Uh, you, you don't have that as much flexibility when you're working with a group, though so there's benefits to groups too. Obviously, you have that kind of social uh, support and things like that, but I chose one-to-one and also because I wanted it to be more like the context that most VCBAs work in because um, the other piece about this study was I wanted to develop a protocol that 
average BCBA or someone or even, I mean, even a skilled RBT could do, could use it. Um, I wanted it to be like, you know, for somebody who doesn't necessarily have a huge amount of back training, that it could be, it was very simple. Um, and that was very important to me for dissemination. I didn't want to just do something that was, you know, required like 10 years of training in order to do it. Uh, or, you know, the work that I do right now is very skilled. I wanted to produce something that, that could be, that I could disseminate and give to people so that more parents could benefit. That was so, so important to me. Um, as well as like wanting to see, does this work? Does this actually work? And, and you know, obviously part of it was learning. And, and I, I did this work with a bunch of other parents that did not make it into the study as I was trying to figure it out. Um, one of the pieces that I had to spend a lot of time figuring out was how to get the data and how to collect IOA, I mean, we couldn't really get actual true IOA because I wasn't following the parents around all day <laughs> and like trying to right, take yeah. behavior. Get IOA really on bath, bath, bathing behavior. Yeah, right. that might be a little, uh, that may be <laughs> exactly. tough to get through the IRB. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of the stuff they were doing was like free offering stuff so they could technically do it any time, any time of the day. And I would have to literally be stalking them 24 7. So, I was trying to figure out all, like, how can I get at least something that is something that's IOA-ish? Uh, so there was a long process. Um, got it. I guess I got off track there. But that's, that's okay. Is that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that, that's cool. Uh, you know, I was going to bring this up later, but uh, I think this is a good time, is the, the whole idea of scope of practice, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, we've got, as behavior analysis becomes... Or, excuse me, as ACT becomes more of a popular feature in behavior analytic training, you know, whether it's workshops, conferences, and things like that. And I know you're participating in the upcoming ACT uh, boot camp for behavior analysts uh, in Reno uh, in a few weeks. And I know you, you were part of the, the group that went, did the same boot camp in Baltimore uh, a few months ago. Um, how do you... I guess, frame up the, the whole idea of scope of practice or scope of competence. Um, what, mm -hmm. you know, um, so it sounds like the intervention design here, uh, you know, the, the, one of the primary goals with this, you were just finished saying was that, you know, you don't need to be an expert in ACT, uh, perhaps, you know, you need, perhaps need to know enough information to, to understand what, you know, the why of what you're doing and things like that. But I guess my general question is, you know, as, as, as ACT becomes, uh, again, more, more of a visible feature of behavior analysis, um, there is a lot of talk about people doing therapy-like things. Obviously, the work that you're doing at McLean is, um, you know, is, uh, is you know, I, I, I don't know, it, representative of, of a, an advanced clinical repertoire, right? You know, and so yeah. you wouldn't take, yeah. you wouldn't pluck any BCBA off the street no. and put them in there. Uh, well, you know. <laughs> um, and, 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 and so how, how do you, I guess, just conceptualize, you know, the boundaries of acceptable practice mm -hmm. for a BCBA who's interested in this work and may not necessarily have had the, the types of training or experiences that you've had, yeah, so I have a few thoughts about this, um, and one of them is, you know, we, I, it, there's, you can think of ACT in different ways, right? So you can think of ACT, if you think of ACT like a protocol or like a thing that you do to someone, um, or you have the hexaflex, you're more likely to get in problems, I think, Um because the protocols and the kind of hexaflex and stuff were designed to help clinical psychologist, essentially. Um, if you think of ACT as behavior analysis, as ABA, and you think about the principles <laughs> below and you stick to that, I think you're going to kind of be a lot safer. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I tend to kind of try to think about it's, for, it's a, for, it's a ABA, but with for verbal behavior okay. for private events. Um, so what I mean by that is like BCBA spend all day long talking to people. I know I've said this before, probably people have heard me talk about this before, but I spend all, I don't spend my day working with a kid with autism. I spend my day talking to the staff that are working with the kid with autism, sure. writing protocols for the person who's working with the kid with autism to uh, implement uh, using my words to tell them what to do. I spent, I talk to parents all day long. I talk to, you know, my HR person all day long. I talk 
to teachers all day long. I talk to these highly verbal humans. And so ACT is a way for us to do that better, to keep our ABA hats on whenever we're talking to people, um, using language more skillfully. And I think that's super important. So it is, does that make sense? Kind of mm-hmm. like ACT for me is, is not, it's just helping me do my job, my regular job better. I'm not doing anything different. Um, you know, I'm just doing what I normally do better, using language more skillfully. So my parents' training sessions are not really any different. Uh, yes, but you would notice that I'm implementing ACT in my parent training sessions. But I was spending one-to-one time talking to parents before, but I was really struggling. We were just going around in circles with the parent telling me, like, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. That's if I could even get them to show up to the session. Um, It was, like, so avoidant that they weren't even, like, they didn't want to come near me, and they didn't want to do any parent training stuff. So I'm, I'm basically still doing the same things, but I'm using my language more effectively um, via ACT. I don't, I guess what I'm, so if you, but if you come at it with from the other perspective of ACT as a protocol, what I see happening is people go, they pick up a book of metaphors and they just start like flinging metaphors at a, at a person. It's kind of like, I'm just going to do a bunch of these exercises and metaphors without any thought about function, why I'm doing it. I'm just throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and hoping something sticks. That's not behavior analysis. <laughs> I love that book, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure uh, you guys can't I, yeah, see this, I know, but I, I'm, not saying, I, I, I'm holding yeah, up the I'm big not, book of act metaphors that happen yeah. to be on my desk as uh, yeah. as you're explaining. And I love that. that book. It's very useful as as it's very useful, but you only useful if you're using it as a analyst and thinking functionally. Like, okay, this is what's happening with this parent. How can I get them more flexible? I need them to do that. Then you might go and be like, okay, what are some stimuli that I could use for this? Does that make sense? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't change, you're not changing your focus of what you're doing. So when you're a BCBA and you're working with a parent of a kid with autism, you are there to help that parent do a better job with their kid. You're not there to fix their anxiety. The anxiety can show up. Like they can say, I'm really, really anxious. You're not going to go in and try and fix that anxiety. You're just going to acknowledge that anxiety and see, okay, this, this anxiety, whatever you want to, however you want to define that, that's showing up and getting in the way. How can I help this parent do what they need? to do um, and I can use ACT to do that without trying to treat their anxiety does that make sense yeah that was one of the things that Jonathan talked about when he was on the show you know if you're yeah. I think one of the I think if I recall correctly you know if you're sticking with observable behavior you're mm-hmm. you're you're in a good place and if you start mm-hmm. thinking that you're treating symptoms self-reported symptoms then mm-hmm. then that's uh, mm-hmm. th- that's a very very slippery slope and you're going to be out of your scope of practice um, pretty mm-hmm. quickly. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. Um, there was something else I was thinking. I mean, also, like when someone's talking to me, I'm. I am. I, that's data, right? When someone's talking to you, that's data that helps you understand like what's going on with a person. Um, and we should be observing and thinking about like not thinking topography, which we thinking function. Like, why is this person saying this to me right now? And how is this affecting what I need them to do? And we don't do that enough. We don't, we just kind of like throw all our ABA principles out the window when someone starts talking to us. Do you know what I mean? And that's a huge issue for our field. And like, to say then we shouldn't do act or we shouldn't care about that or we shouldn't be, you know, thinking about how we talk to people is, is a really huge problem. Um, yeah. Like I, I think duty, we have a duty to like do this work. We have a duty to be better with our language and um, like also acknowledge that we are part of the problem. You know, we are part of the context. When we're standing there talking to a parent, we are part of the context for that parent's behavior. Like, we, we can't, like, st- it's not like when you're observing a kid in school where you can stand back and, like, watch the behavior happening and you're not really part of what's happening unless the kid obviously is reacting to being there. It's not like that. When you're, when you're interacting with a person, you have a listener and a speaker and you're actually part of the context for that parent's behavior, whether it's their verbal behavior or otherwise. So we, we, we have to start thinking about these things because behavior analysts, you know, like it's, it's absurd to me to just be like, I'm just not going to be a behavior analyst right now because you're talking to me. 
I see. Yeah, good point. Good point. I, I'm, I'm going to imagine you guys are probably going to get into that at the at the boot camp. What uh, what aspects are you uh, looking for with this uh, with this particular boot camp, and and more specifically, what um, what do you plan on reviewing with attendees? You can give per- people a little sneak peek. I'm going to be talking about working with parents and kids, teens, um, and. Kind of my goal is really a practical one, like to give people like the tools that they can kind of walk away and start doing some of this stuff uh, with the families that they work with. Um, and I also will be talking about uh, are we doing some ethics based stuff on diversity, uh, diversity in ABA? And I think there's something else they asked me to train on and I'm blanking on it. I feel like it was four things. Maybe staff. I think maybe working with staff as well. I can't mm-hmm. remember now. That's I terrible. See. I forgot. <laughs> I need to look that up. Yeah. Pretty much try to cover everything. I think I have like a day and I'm trying to like do everything. <laughs> I see. I see. Well, it sounds like lots of interesting topics to cover. Uh, very very mm-hmm. timely ones. So, awesome. This has been, uh, I could keep asking you questions all morning, but uh, I, I know we both have things, uh, other things to do. And, uh, you're, you're, I think you're on, this is a vacation day for you too, right? If I'm not mistaken. So I know I'm cutting yeah, into some, some, some of your, uh, values directed behavior. So, um, uh, uh, I, I, I know you dispensed some advice for the newly minted BCBA earlier. And if I recall correctly, it's stock people. Um, so yeah. is, is there, so uh, we other... might be, be thoughtful about it. Like find, you know, you, you don't want to create work for people either. So that would be a piece of advice. It's like go after people that are doing things that are very cool that you really care about and ask, you know, you can ask them to help you, but also don't create work for them. Do your homework and um, try to make it as easy for them as possible to help you and, you know, be a reinforcer, essentially. Like, you know, tell them what it is you like about what they're doing. Be reinforcing to interact with. Be nice. Um you know, be passionate about what you do, uh, and, and make it easy for them. Uh, I would say finding a mentor, like similar, we're talking about scope of practice and like competence, find a mentor. Just so I, I could not be where I am today without seeking out mentors. And I still have mentors. Like, I think that's very, very important, not being an Island and always be seeking opportunities to build your skills um, and find, you know, if you don't have colleagues around you, find, you know, go on social media or go on the listservs, join special interest groups and that kind of thing. Connect with others and then form your own little consult group. Uh, that That is very meaningful, like to get that peer support as well as like the kind of mentor support. Um, yeah, be flexible. All right. <laughs> and also listen to your podcast. Oh. You're very Thank you. On that podcast, follow follow your advice, follow Matt's advice. Mm-hmm. Uh, great, great. Well, uh, Evelyn, this has been just a, a lot of fun. Um, good luck with the boot camp, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking to you at a, at a uh, later on down the road because uh, I, I know I'm going to get lots of great feedback on this episode. I'm sure there's listeners like, "Oh, you just scratched the surface of you know whether it's parent training or the diversity piece and things like that that people want to hear more of." So, uh, thanks so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.